Where's Glenn? That's the problem. He needs to get over there. All right. Um, my name is Rick Miller. I'd like to welcome you to uh, Spratt United Methodist Church family. Um, and we'll go through a few announcements before we get started. Um, Church in the Park is still going on the 21st, 28th of July. Canceled today because of the rain, but August 4th, let's see, what do we got? Church in the Park. Governor's board meeting. Upcoming events, we got our outdoor service on the 8th of September, just to put it on your calendar. Ladies are having a soup sandwich dinner on the 22nd of August from 5 to 7. Um, week, weekly Bible study is going to start again in September on the 11th. And the 22nd of September is going to be our service at the Old Spratt Church in town. So if you want to put those on your calendar or put this... Uh, bulletin aside to remember that, that would be great. All right, if you could please all rise for our call to worship. What, do you have an announcement? Yeah. Okay. Okay, call to worship. I will read the light print if you would please respond by reading the dark. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the world that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the faith that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. This is the church that the Lord has made. Okay, remain standing. Our first uh, song will be 370, Victory in Jesus.
may be seated. Birthdays and anniversaries, we pretty much covered all of those last week. Unless there's anybody we missed or somebody has a new anniversary they want to talk about. No, okay. <laughs> So, sharing of joys and concerns. Anybody have a joy or concern they'd like to share? Yeah, I'd, I'd like to uh, uh, have prayers for uh, our former president, Donald Trump, uh, who was shot yesterday at a rally in Pennsylvania. Uh, he's doing well. He was treated and released. Uh, and uh, there were... Uh, some people in the audience that, that died from gunfire and uh, our Secret Service took out the assailant. I didn't, I didn't watch the news this morning, so I don't have the latest details. I was watching it up till about 11 o'clock last night and, uh, uh, and then went to bed. So you may know more about it than I do, but uh, prayers for, uh, for his recovery and uh, also uh, prayers for our political climate. Uh, there's been a lot of uh, just sharp words and uh, sometimes even name calling or uh, rhetoric that's just not the way it should be. Um, I, I'm remembering uh, more dignified campaigns when I was a kid and over my <laughs> 60 years of, of life. So uh, just prayers for our, our political discourse and uh, that the rhetoric can be calmed down and the, 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 the threats of violence and, and acts of violence be uh, uh, suppressed. Uh, lower, the, lower the heat, as it were. Um, Joshua is... Uh, going to be with us 15 more days. And then he ships out on the 29th of July. That is the plan all along, and the time is moving along quite quickly. Um, and we're, uh, we're not quite prepared for it, Rhonda or myself. And uh, um, so we're going to take a little bit of, of, of vacation time between now and then to spend with him. Uh, so just uh, to let you be aware of that. Um, and, uh, and keep us all in your prayers. Him as he goes into uh, boot camp in the Navy and uh, us as uh, uh, we uh, prepare to be empty nesters, which we did not think we would be for a couple more years. We thought the plan was ACC and, and, uh, and then maybe transferring to a four-year school. But we got a call on Wednesday, and his recruiter said, our last mandatory meeting is tomorrow. you got to be there in Traverse City. And, and his truck can't make it to Traverse City. So we drove him over there and enjoyed Traverse City a little bit and waited a couple hours until his meeting was done and then drove him back. And that's, that's why we didn't get to our, our camper and our property this Thursday, Friday. Um, so anyway... Um, and another note I shared with council on Tuesday night, uh, I got some news, uh, 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 a little while ago, uh, about 10 days ago, I guess, that, uh, uh, my test results came back from my biopsy and, uh, I do have prostate cancer, uh, now, it is 90% curable. Uh, and I have a great doctor, Dr. Baum. Uh, many of you know him and, and uh, have appreciated his medical ministry over the years. Uh, and uh, he said, if I do nothing, I will live 12 more years. But I'm, I'm going to follow the course of treatment. And that will either involve radiation or um, surgery are the options that we've talked about. I have some tests coming up this Friday, so I won't get to the property, uh, in Gaylord um, to uh, 
to do staging, to know what stage this is in, if it's spread beyond the first stage. And uh, so they need to do, they've done typing, they now need to do staging before they form a treatment plan uh, with me. So I appreciate your prayers, and uh, I just want you to have accurate information. Uh, it's uh, somewhere between uh, high 80s and mid 90 percent curable. So I've just rounded it to 90, and and that's an easy figure to remember. But um, anyway, I, and appreciate having a good urologist in the area. Uh, he is a, a a good guy. So. Um, Pastor, yeah. I'd like to ask for prayers. I'm going through some tests that came up and Trevor said he got for my heart problems that I've had first. Okay. Prayers, Very good. Absolutely. Uh, Russ Robel, who, who has uh, done a lot for us, uh, he and, and Linda are, are on some vacation time and so um, our, our We'll need uh, to update the prayer list. Uh, can you do that, Pam? Yes. Thank you. Pa uh, Pam Crawford and Duane are new to our church. Uh, I think you've been here every week, though. God bless you. And Pam, uh, Pam was the administrative assistant at the Indian River United Methodist Church, uh, where a friend of mine pastored for years, and she worked with him and and. Uh, before she moved to this area and and now is a part of our congregation. We're very fortunate to have them. And Pam, uh, when we asked if there was a volunteer out there who might help in the office, Pam said, uh, I'm your huckleberry. Uh, <laughs> and uh, so thank you for answering that need and that call. Uh, so she'll be helping us uh, in the office a bit. Yeah, well, that's okay. That that uh, that's a doable thing. Um, we've been working ahead a little bit in our bulletins, so some of that information will will seem a little static. But um, anyway, um, just trying to remember. If there, did you have something? Yeah, uh, unspoken prayer for the family this week. Okay. Very good. Um, yes. This morning when I woke up, I'm so tired. And I had to get up and take a shower and get dressed. And you know, all of these things you do to work for the church. And I'm laying there in bed. I really don't want to get up. And I have a poem on my digital postcard. And one of the things that <laughs> well, I know. Yeah, I got, I got to be careful not to laugh at that one, don't I? <laughs> Shapers. All right. Very good. Very good. Okay. And uh, the old saying, the, the biblical teaching, uh, more than an old saying, is resist the devil and he must flee. So, uh, some people uh, have a, it requires a greater effort to come to church than others. And uh, I realized that, I, I realized that profoundly, I guess, about 15 years ago when I was serving a church and... Uh, there was a fellow who had brain cancer and it had gotten to the point where he was wheelchair bound and, and uh, very limited. He had been the a computer expert and a church treasurer and, and a young professional man. And, and uh, when I was there, he, uh, uh, he was wheelchair bound and it was a struggle for him and his wife to, to get going and get there in church. And, and sometimes they'd come rushing in a few minutes after the call to worship. Uh, we don't know what people's circumstances are. And it's important to uh, 
Not only are we saved by grace, but we live by grace, right? So we don't know what people's circumstances are. And uh, uh, I remember talking to him and, and hearing their story and, and just feeling a great appreciation for the effort they made to get to church. Um, anyway, well, let's, uh, let's join in a spirit of prayer. Gracious God, we are thankful to gather here in your name, to gather here in your spirit. Lord, we are thankful that you uh, uh, have called us here, that you have a blessing for us this day. Help each one to receive the blessing you have for them. We are blessed to join our prayers with the prayers of others. For those needing healing, for those undergoing difficult situations, for those recovering from injury or sickness or surgery. Lord, we uh, we ask for your Holy Spirit to be that source of strength and healing, of comfort, of wisdom, of guidance. May we have the eyes of faith and the ears of faith and hearts of faith to know the prompting of your Holy Spirit. And may we have the resolve to answer that prompting with yes, Lord. May your will be done. We lift these prayers, both spoken and unspoken, in Jesus' name, the name that is above every name, as we pray together the prayer he's taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. And all these things shall be added unto you. Amen. It's time for our choral anthem. What are we singing today? We are singing. Be still my soul. Be still my soul. Okay. That is 534.
Our first um, scripture reading is Colossians chapter 1, verses 15 through 20, 23 to, through 24. He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For in him all things in heaven and on earth were created, things visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions, or rulers or powers. All things have been created through him for him. He himself is before all things, and in him all things hold together. He is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, so that he might come to have first place in everything. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell. And through him God was pleased to reconcile to himself all things whether on earth or in heaven, by making peace through the blood of the, his cross. I, Paul, became a servant of this gospel. I am now rejoicing in my sufferings for your sake, and in my flesh I am completing what is lacking in Christ's afflictions. For the sake of his body, that is the church. This is the word of God for the people of God. And I thought I'd, I'd share something that I learned a few years back. Uh, I didn't know this uh, when I was your age. In fact, I, uh, I didn't really learn it until really, again, a few years ago. Uh, the Bible has two words in Hebrew for God. Uh, one is just God, the, the word God. And the other word is God's proper name. Like your proper name is Ireland, and my proper name is Rob, or Robert. So, sometimes it says in the Bible, uh, you shall love the Lord your God. And, and where they put the word Lord in, they were afraid to say God's name in vain. You know that's one of the Ten Commandments, right? So they, they substituted the word Lord in there for God's proper name so that nobody would say it in, a, in an unworthy way. And so where it says the Lord your God, it's saying God's proper name, your God. Okay? And if God's name were James, it would be Love the uh, love uh, James, your God, with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. So that's kind of how it, it, it's working. With, oh, you get it, okay? You're, are you good at English? Yeah, okay. I, I struggle with some of that grammar stuff, but uh, anyway, I, I didn't have a good. Uh, I didn't. I didn't know my grammar to to help help me learn it. <laughs> I, I really pushed you over the edge on that one, didn't I? Okay. Um, so God's proper name that we never want to say disrespectfully is written as Y-H-W-H. Because Hebrew doesn't have any vowels. So we don't know how to pronounce it, these four letters. Y-H-W-H. -H. And in Hebrew, the language that the Old Testament was in, they had pronunciation marks that told you how to pronounce these uh, groups of letters so you knew how to pronounce words because they didn't have any vowels. But the priests, the scribes that were writing the scriptures, put in nonsensical pronunciation marks so that people couldn't say the name of God if they wanted to. It's like, can't do it doesn't make sense to keep people from saying God's name in an unworthy way. Now, maybe, maybe God is concerned about that to, to some extent, but I, I'll tell you a secret. God's name 
God's proper name, sounds like us when we breathe. Yahweh. Yahweh. So, God's funny little joke is that everybody in the whole world, every time they take a breath, he is calling on the name of the Lord. They don't even know it. When you take a breath, you're calling on the name of God. Uh, I think it helps to know that. I think that's encouraging. And it kind of shows us that God has a sense of humor. Okay? Uh, so, God's proper name in the Old Testament was, uh, was listed as Yahweh. That's how scholars believe that it was pronounced. And uh, uh, we know that God is love and uh, that, that Jesus came to show us who God is really like, what God is really like and who God is. So let's have a prayer. Lord, God bless uh, Ireland. God bless all of our children. God bless us, everyone, in your holy name. Amen. Would you like a piece of candy? Okay. I would love a piece of candy too, but I'm a diabetic, so... <laughs> No candy for me. All right, fellas, offering time. Let's continue to worship uh, uh, the Lord your God. Now you know what that means uh, as we present our tithes and offerings. standing we'll read the prayer of dedication and I believe part of it is cut off in your bulletin but we'll try and get through it gracious God we return a portion of the blessing that you have given us bless your church O Lord may we always be faithful to the work of Christ to which you have called us this we pray in Jesus name amen and the hymn, I Love You, Lord. We're going to sing that through twice.
You may be seated. Our gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew's gospel. It is the 16th chapter, verses 13 through 20. And uh, uh, yeah, I'm going to be reading, I'm going to be referring in my sermon to uh, some things that happen right after this reading, but I, I didn't include it uh, uh, in the scripture passage here. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, some say John the Baptist, but others Elijah, and still others Jeremiah or one of the prophets. Jesus said to them, but who do you say that I am? And Simon Peter answered, you are the Messiah, which is the, the Jewish word for Christ, uh, or the Greek word Christ is the Jewish word for is, is the Greek word for the Jewish word Messiah. Uh, you are the Messiah, the Son of the Living God. And Jesus answered him, "Blessed are you, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father in heaven. And I tell you." You are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not prevail against it. Uh, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you, you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he sternly ordered the disciples not to tell anyone that he was the Messiah. May God bless the reading and hearing of the holy words of Scripture. Uh, there is a question that's not a trick question, but it is a tricky question. And many Christians get the answer wrong. The question is, who owns the church? Or to whom does the church belong? And the answer is, is far more important than most of us realize. It's a question that churches really do need to consider. But in our casual day-to-day -day thinking, we often forget. For example, people ask pastors all the time, uh, what's the name of your church? Or where is your church? Or what time does your church begin worship? And pastors know what people mean. So pastors typically speak as if the church belongs to them. My church is the Spratt United Methodist Church. My church is located on, on M65. And my church uh, worships at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning. And parishioners commonly talk about their church. They say things like, I love my church. And... My church is having a potluck this Sunday. Uh, and I, I really do like that sense of belonging. We, we need that. And I like that sense of personal commitment. We need that as well. But there is another side to it. There's a problem that can creep in without us realizing it. Sometimes we forget that the church does not belong to us. We belong to the church, but the church does not belong to us. Now, I want to say that loud and clear. This is not my church. This is the church that I serve as pastor. This is not my church. I know that. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that I know that. I want you to know that I know that you know that this is not my church. This is not my church. This is the church I serve. This church belongs to Christ. If a church ceases to belong to Christ, it has in many ways ceased to be a church. Pastors have egos, sometimes really big egos. 
Sometimes those really big egos drive a, a pastor to strive to, to create a big church, a mega church. And that sense of ownership creeps in. But God owns the church, not the pastor. So you've already guessed my next part, and that is that this is not your church. This is not your church. This is the church to which you belong. Those are the most accurate statements that we can make about the church. Now some would say, well, you know what I mean. I, I don't, when I say this is my church, I don't mean literally that I own the church. And I do know that. Most people who speak about their church don't literally mean that, that it belongs to them. Most would say that it belongs to all of us. Some would say it, it belongs to the denomination. But those claims are, are not much more accurate. The church belongs to Christ. That's it. That's the bottom line. That is the truest statement that we can make. In today's scripture, Jesus says, Who do you say that I am? And, and Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, responds, You are the Messiah, the son of the living God. And that, my friends, is an A-plus answer. And Jesus commends Simon, son of Jonah, for his A-plus answer. And he says, From now on, you are Simon Peter. You are the rock. Peter is Petra. It means rock. You are the rock that I will build my church on. He, he, Jesus is literally saying that, that A-plus answer, that solid answer, that's the foundation for my church. And... Uh, Jesus tells Peter, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Joseph, Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my, my Father in heaven. And I tell you, you are Petra. You are Peter. And on this rock I will build my church. Says Christ. He owns the church. He owns the church. I want to come back to this, but first let me point out Jesus' uh, sense of humor here. Simon, son of Jonah, this is the guy that we call Peter. Petra, rock. And from this day on, Jesus and the disciples called him Peter, or Simon Peter. And uh, that means rock, and that means uh, that day he earned the nickname Rocky. That's it. That's what they're calling him. Rocky. This very day, uh, Jesus proclaims that on that solid foundation, I'll build my church on Peter's solid profession of faith. And so now you know that Jesus isn't always so serious that he's not willing to make a good pun. Because that's what he does here. With the word rock and Peter and on that rock, I will build my church. So I wonder what nicknames he'd give some of you. Hmm? <laughs> if Jesus were here, if he, if he walked a few miles with you, I, 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 wonder, I wonder what nicknames he might give to some of you. Um, I've, I've got some hunches out there. Um, uh, but but uh, anyway, I'll refrain. So Jesus tells us clearly that the church belongs to him. And, and why is that distinction so important? It's important for two reasons. First, it gets us focused on the lordship of Christ. We don't often talk about the, the lordship of Christ. Uh, often that formula is, do you profess Jesus as your Lord and Savior? We know what Savior is. The Lord is, is the one who who is, is the head of our life, the, the one we follow. 
And secondly, because it helps us consider his will for the church. So the lordship of Christ and his will for the church, acknowledging it is his church, helps us focus in those two ways. Because many churches forget that they belong to Christ. They, they know that they serve Christ. But they think in terms of church buildings. And they think that they own the church building and that they're the ones that make the big decisions and they're the ones that pay the bills. So they are the church. And they own the church. It makes a certain amount of sense, honestly. And when that happens, the focus becomes, what should we do? Or worse, what do we want to do? And that's the wrong focus. That's the wrong question to ask. The question that the church always needs to consider is, what does God want us to do? What is God's vision for this church? What is God's will for this church? I remember as a, as a young man, I was close to uh, our pastor, our new pastor, and he became a mentor for me. He was encouraging me into the ministry, and, and so I, I spent a, a fair amount of time with him. And our church had a, a big vote coming up that we, we didn't know which way, it would, which way it would go. And I was asking him about uh, this proposal to the council and if he thought it would pass, and he said, well, I'm going to remind them that the only vote that really counts is the one who's, that has nail holes through his, his hands. In other words, when we vote in council, when we vote as a church, we're voting for Christ's will to be done. That's the only vote that really counts. It's Christ's church. It's not mine. And it's not yours. That's one of the big points in, in Rick Warren, Pastor Rick Warren's book, The Purpose Driven Church. Many of you have probably read The Purpose Driven Life, where he talks about God's will for your life and how you discern that. But he wrote a book before that called The Purpose Driven Church. And to be a, a healthy church, we need to focus on Christ's will for us. And not on our own preferences. That may sound obvious. Uh, and you may think that I'm exaggerating how people think that the church is theirs. But it's subtle, very subtle. And it creeps in when we're not looking. It creeps in when we're distracted. It, it happens just as we're committing ourselves to getting the job done. We look around and, and we see there's work to be done and we know that somebody's gotta step up and get it done and we roll up our sleeves and we get to the work for our church. I want my church to look nice. And it does. It's beautiful. Thank you to whoever's keeping the flowers out there. Uh, extraordinary. I've always enjoyed looking at this church as I drive by before I was your pastor and now that I am. And I want my church to be successful and I want my church to attract newcomers and I want my church to love people as Christ has loved me. And it's very subtle that it becomes my church. And we displace the head of the church who is Christ, our Lord. We stop asking what is God's will for us and we stop listening to Christ in pursuit of our own action plan. And the same thing happened to Simon Peter. 
right after he gives that really great A-plus answer. And Jesus commends him for it. Jesus tells them what God's plan is. That the Son of Man is going to be arrested and persecuted and beaten and killed. And uh, Peter can't stand it. And he rebukes Jesus. He, he takes Jesus aside and he says, Lord, we'd never let that happen to you. Stop talking that way. Stop that nonsense. And that sounds noble, and it sounds heroic, and it sounds faithful. Peter has what he believes Christ best at heart. But Jesus rebukes Peter. And just moments after saying, you're the A-plus answer, that profession I'm going to build my church on, Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. For you do not have the things of, uh, in mind, the things of God, but the, rather the things of man. And that had to hurt. That had to hurt. That, that is a mistake that I think every one of us would have made in Peter's shoes. Peter was so sure that he knew what was best for Christ and for himself and for the others. And uh, there are times when, when we may not fully grasp it, but Jesus is telling them very clearly that God's plan was for Jesus to die on the cross. And that was hard for them to hear. We know the story from the, the post-resurrection point of view. 2,000 plus years post-resurrection. But uh, they didn't. And if we're honest, we'd probably admit that we'd vote and approve Peter's motion. Nope, none of us is going to let that happen to Jesus. But it didn't represent what God was doing in the world. It didn't represent the will of God, says Jesus. In fact, it was diametrically opposed to Christ's mission. And that's, that's what I think can happen when the church stops asking the God questions. The God questions being, what is God's will? What is God's calling us to be about? What is God's vision for our church, for this church? We don't intend to take a misstep, but it happens. And, and it happens most to Christians who, who haven't grown fully in their sense of discipleship. Um, we're called to be disciples. A lot of people think we're called to be believers. Being a believer is the first step of becoming a disciple. It's not the last step of our faith. It's the first step of being a disciple. Jesus calls us to be his disciples in the world. And in Matthew 28, Jesus gives the Great Commission. He says, go into the world and make disciples of all nations. God's plan, God's vision for churches is to be filled full of disciples, not merely believers. Believing is a good thing, but it's not the last step we take. So this misstep happens to Christians who've not grown sufficiently in their, in their sense of discipleship. They, they, uh, they're not quite there yet. It happens to those who are eager to to please God and to do good, but who haven't learned to listen for God's will on a daily basis or at least a regular basis. And it happens to those who've, who've not learned to seek God's will ahead of their own. And that, that is the crux of discipleship. I, I'm a Christian believer. I'm a pastor. I'm a good, well-intentioned person. And my path 
90 some odd percent of the time agrees with the path that I believe God has for me. But where there's divergence, where this is my will and I know that God's will is this way and there's a fork in the road, that's the crux of discipleship. Whose will do I follow at that point? That's the challenge of discipleship. It's easy to follow God's will when it corresponds with your will, but who's in charge hasn't quite been revealed at that point. It becomes revealed when there's a divergence. When God's calling you in one direction and you want to go the other way. Well, it takes time to discern God's will. It takes prayer to discern God's will. And it takes discipline to submit to God's will. In the gospel story today, Jesus walked and talked with the disciples for years, possibly for as long as three years, before he asked them that question, but who do you say that I am? They may have followed Jesus for three years before Peter made that profession, you are the Messiah, you're the son of the living God. A wise Christian takes time to reflect on God's word. A wise Christian seeks to discern God's will for their life and for their church and for their community regularly, even on a daily basis. A wise leader keeps the God questions at the heart of the business of the church so the church can do its business without becoming a business. This is God's church. And I'm grateful to belong to it. And I hope you are too. Thanks be to God. Amen. I... uh, We'd have a sing our closing hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. Let's stand. It's uh, it'll be on the screen. <laughs>
Let us go forth. Remembering that God's love is steadfast and everlasting. That the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is always there for us. And sufficient for our need. Let us go forth in the fellowship of the Holy Spirit. In the power of the Holy Spirit. Knowing that God is with us always. Thanks be to God. Amen. Thank <laughs> you.